All right, so this is part two of the shock lecture, and we're going to continue on with the slide that was right after the last one with the bad shortcut that I showed you. So we're in sepsis, septic shock. So what are some manifestations? So it's directly related to poor vascular tone and vasodilation with venous pooling. There's relative hypovolemia despite having adequate volume. Um, septic shock is typically divided into early and late stages. So early, uh, the early stage, they call early or warm sepsis. So it's the initial inflammatory response. Manifestations are typical of a compensatory stage with the exception of a fever and warm skin. Hemodynamics, you'll have cardiac output that's increased. Filling pressures are low. Your PAOP and CVP are low. Um, you'll have tachycardia, warm flush skin, bounding pulses, febrile. And then your systemic vascular resistance is low because of this profound systemic vasodilation. Your SVO2 is normal. Remember that SVO2 is a reflection of oxygen consumption at the tissue level. So cardiac output increases, tachycardia, bounding pulses, warm flush skin for warm early sepsis. And then your filling pressures are low. So late or cold sepsis, the late stage of sepsis, um, it's very typical of your progressive stage with hypothermia. So hypothermia, cold, late stage, kind of consider those related, related to help you uh, remember the late stage. So it's characterized by cool, pale skin. You'll have weak and thready pulses and, of course, hypothermia. You'll have some tachycardia, uh, but your blood pressure remains low. Further signs of end organ hypoperfusion may be present. So hemodynamics might be low cardiac output. You'll have low filling pressures unless you get volume replacement. Systemic vascular resistance is low. So what can we do for septic shock? Really prevention is the key. That's why you need to do meticulous assessments and monitoring of the patient's hemodynamics. So hand washing, aseptic techniques, limiting invasive procedures. Um, there's ventilator associated pneumonia. So we usually have protocols to prevent VAP from occurring or VAP, um, including, you know, with that, so a VAP protocol includes aggressive mouth care, brushing of the teeth with chlorhexidine products with all of our ventilated patients. So that's huge in the ICU is this VAP protocol. Um, you might do oxygen, of course, oxygen supplementation and then uh, parental nutrition or enteral nutrition is needed. Fluid resuscitation does tend to decrease the mortality. Uh, we'll do some vasopressors if needed, so dopamine or epi. Um, if you look, there's a surviving sepsis bundle of care on table 14.7. It's on page 278. It shows a specific time frame for interventions to be done within three hours of onset arrival and within six, and within six hours. So within less, so less than three hours, in that three-hour window, we want to measure lactate levels, obtain blood cultures prior to administering your antibiotics, we want to administer the, a broad spectrum antibiotic, really until we get the blood culture results back, and then administer IV fluids and administer a vasopressor if needed, especially if your blood pressure is not responding to the fluid resuscitation we're doing with um, IV fluids. So some complications, we talked a little bit about this. So DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation, so this is the hematological disorder most commonly caused by sepsis. There are two stages. You have the clotting or the initial thrombotic stage and then the bleeding stage. So the clotting stage is present with cyanosis and ischemia in the fingers and toes and the tip of the nose. 
organ ischemia may also exist. You'll have enhanced coagulation, large amounts of thrombin, thrombin are produced, and the initial thrombotic stage can actually last hours or even several days. So this clotting stage you want to monitor for and have cyanosis and ischemia in the fingers and toes and the tip of the nose. So look for those look for those things in your assessments. The bleeding stage, which uh, it's figure 14.7 or 14.8. I wrote two different figures down here, but it's on page 279. So the bleeding stage is from a lack of clotting factors results in excessive bleeding due to the inability to form clots. So in this case, you want to monitor their D-dimer, platelets, PT, and PTT for lab work. Um, and then another complication is this MODS, or multiple organ, organ dysfunction syndrome, which is a result of the excessive inflammation associated with severe injury or sepsis. So it's caused by several factors leading to decreased oxygen delivery to the organ systems, causing impaired tissue perfusion. Typically, this will begin in the lungs. You'll have development of ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and it has a mortality rate of 40%. So it's another thing that you might see in a lot of physicians charting in their H&P notes is that they develop MODs. Um, you'll end up with profound impaired cellular function, metabolic acidosis, and organ failure. So it usually, um, you know, begins with ARDS, and then after ARDS it will progress in sequence to include renal, hepatic, then GI. So when three or more body systems are involved, it's associated with an 80 to 90% mortality rate. And then uh, cardiovascular and neurological involvement are nearly 100% mortality. So let's go to the connection check. Which of the following patients should be assessed first? A post-op patient complaining of pain, a post-op patient with decreased urine output, a post-op or a pre-op patient being ready for the OR, a pre-op patient requiring antibiotics prior to surgery. So go ahead and pause and answer the question. Okay, so here's the answer. So the answer is B. Rationale is the pain is prioritized as a psychosocial issue. It's not physical. Um, readying for the OR and prophylactic antibiotics or interventions for potential problems. Is that really a priority? And then the post-op patient with decreased urine output has an actual problem and is showing signs of sepsis, those early signs. So we want to do prompt intervention to prevent any deterioration along that sepsis continuum. So nursing management of septic shock. So assessments, we want to monitor our LOC, vital signs, all hemodynamics, urine output, skin color, and temperature. We want to look for the complications like our DIC or MODs, look at our labs, ABG with base excess, a lactate, SVO2 or SVBO2, look at our um, comprehensive metabolic panel, our D-dimer, PT, PTT, and platelets, and then of course blood cultures times two. Main thing we can do is prevention, so we want to monitor uh, for any progression. And for oxygen, too, we want to make sure that we're providing good oxygenation as needed, so non-rebreather or mechanical ventilation. We'll do aggressive fluid resuscitation. We'll also do some vasoactive drips if needed and antibiotics after our blood cultures are obtained. So for nursing management, we'll want to do some teaching, so instruct the patient and family on the causes of sepsis, what their cause was specifically, Allow for visitation as tolerated. Uh, of course, do meticulous hand washing and oral care and also teach that to the patient. Uh, we want to evaluate our outcomes by determining was it successful treatment, 
do we have satisfactory blood pressure levels and good cardiac output and adequate tissue perfusion? Main thing is, is we want to monitor the progress of the patient. So we're going to look at some shock pharmacology now. If you look at table 14.5, on page 268, it lists drugs common to treat shock. So shock pharmacology. Uh, there's also a vasoactive drips document, not on Moodle, but on Canvas. So make sure you pull that up and review all of your vasoactive medications. Um, other medications include diuretics for our cardiogenic shock, sodium bicarb, and antidysrhythmics. So sodium bicarb helps to treat uh, acidotic states. Uh, we might do some antibiotics, uh, epinephrine, antihistamines, uh, our inhalers, and then uh, morphine to help dilate the veins and decrease anxiety if needed. Let's do a little review here. So what's the rationale for each of the following? So if you want, I have, um, I'll go over each of these and give you the answer, but if you want to take the time right now and pause and then try to answer on your own what each of these are for and what the rationale is, then you can come back and get the answers for me. So if you want to do that, pause, answer these on your own, and then hit play again and then you'll get the answers. So H&H, uh, &H, we're doing that, hemoglobin and hematocrit for fluid status, we're going to monitor anemia especially if it's hypovolemic shock, we want to look to see if there's any blood loss. Uh, our ABGs, there is a handout on uh, Canvas, so it's great information for you on how to complete ABGs. So please open that up and review that, and you can, there's resources in there too to help, um, and, and even some practice opportunities uh, for reading ABGs and interpreting them. Uh, let's see, SVO2 and SVCO2, so it tells us of inadequate oxygen delivery. So SVO2 is mixed venous oxygen saturation, or SVO2. If less than 60%, it indicates increased oxygen extraction at the tissue level, indicating decreased oxygen delivery. So SVO2 is a reflection of oxygen consumption at the tissue level. And then SCVO2 is our central venous oxygen saturation. So serum lactate indicates acidosis and sepsis. Uh, increased abnormal levels are indicators of increased risk of mortality. So anything greater than two is abnormal. The higher it gets, the higher the mortality rate is. CMP, comprehensive metabolic panel, is for liver function tests. So that's an addition. Uh, to the, which is not included in the basic metabolic panel. That can show us decreased organ perfusion, look at organ failure more intensely. And then our basic metabolic panel will also show us decreased organ perfusion and status of electrolytes, but won't have any of the uh, liver function tests in there. Urine specific gravity, so, and osmolality. Uh, urine specific gravity is a laboratory test that shows the concentration of all chemical particles in the urine. It also will evaluate fluid volume and concentration. And then blood cultures will let us look for uh, infection and identify what type of uh, bacteria is present. And then our white blood cell count with differentials. So total white count is for sepsis. Um, and eosinophils will look for an anaphylaxis. Our neutrophils and monocytes are for an acute bacterial infection. So. Uh, those are some of the items we'll look at with the white blood cell count. And then, of course, cardiac enzymes, if it's cardiogenic shock, and then uh, CVC, you know, which hemodynamic values. Um, SCVO2, our central venous oxygen saturation, can be monitored and closely correlates with SVO2. So if they have uh, a CVC or a pulmonary artery, a central venous catheter, a pulmonary artery catheter in place, what hemodynamic what hemodynamic values can we measure with those pieces in place? Um, which with the CVC we can monitor the SCVO2 and uh, SVO2. Uh, pulmonary artery catheter. So which hemodynamic values? The pulmonary artery pressure, 
uh, which is for monitoring pulmonary hypertension, our PAOP or PAWP, so pulmonary wedge pressures, as well for left heart, left heart preload. And then we can draw SVO2 samples, which gives us our mixed venous oxygen saturations. All right. Connection check. So the nurse understands that the following indicates the initial phase of DIC. Bleeding from all puncture sites, cold modeled extremities, increased antithrombin 3 levels, or increased fibrin degradation products. All right, the answer is B, cold modeled extremities. So the initial phase of DIC is characterized by enhanced clotting and obstructing flow that causes cold model extremities. One reason for enhanced clotting is decreased antithrombin 3 levels. The second phase of DIC characterized by excessive bleeding due to clot breakdown results in increased fibrin degradation products. Wrap up of our case study. So Mike's condition worsens after admission when he was admitted to the intermediate care unit. Despite his two liters uh, of normal saline we gave, his blood pressure continues to deteriorate. He's increasingly lethargic and tachypneic with respiratory alkalosis. Urine output is decreasing and creatinine is elevated at two, indicating acute renal failure. His respiratory status continues to deteriorate and he is transferred to ICU for mechanical ventilation. He has a central venous catheter inserted to monitor his CVP and SVCO2. A norepi drip and fluid resuscitation is continued. Here's a wrap up. So after several days of fluids, IV antibiotics and mechanical ventilation, Mike begins to improve. His CVP normalizes and blood pressure stabilizes. He's weaned off of his norepi drip. His SCVO2 returns to normal. He's weaned off the ventilator and extubated. Urine output and kidney function improve, so better. So the next um, several, we've got some case study questions that we'll go through here. This is all related to the case study. Um, so Mike's nurse monitors him for which clinical manifestations in the early stages of septic shock. Decreased cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, increased pulmonary artery wedge pressure, or increased cardiac output. The answer is D, increased cardiac output. So the early stage of septic shock is characterized by increased cardiac output, low filling pressures, and low systemic vascular resistance. All right, case study question two. It is a priority for Mike's nurse to follow up with the provider about which order. Start antibiotics, prepare a dopamine drip, hourly vital sign, send one set of blood cultures. So the answer is D. We need two sets of blood cultures from two different sites are recommended to accurately identify what organism it is before starting antibiotics. So they do an anaerobic and an aerobic bottle set for two different sites. Mike's nurse incorporates which nursing diagnosis into the plan of care? Decreased cardiac output related to impaired contractility, decreased cardiac output related to increased afterload, impaired tissue perfusion related to vasodilation, or impaired tissue perfusion related to loss of sympathetic tone. So the answer is C. Sepsis is characterized as impaired tissue perfusion related to widespread systemic vasodilation decreasing afterload. Impaired contractility results in cardiogenic shock. Impaired tissue perfusion related to loss of sympathetic tone is a result of neurogenic shock. All right, Mike's nurse evaluates which parameter as an, indica as an indication of adequacy of treatment. Right arterial pressure is PAOP, SPO2, or SVO2. Okay, 
So the answer is D. Remember, SVO2 reflects oxygen consumption, providing information on perfusion at the tissue level. Right arterial pressure and PAOP indicates filling volumes, but does not indicate adequacy of those volumes. SPO2 is a reflection of pulmonary status, not necessarily reflecting adequacy of treatment of shock. Question 5. Mike's nurse understands which laboratory results indicate his condition is improving. Select all that apply. An increasing lactate level, decreasing base excess level, increasing SCVO2 level, decreasing lactate level, or increasing B1 and creatinine. The answers are B, C, and D. So decreasing base excess, increasing SCVO2, and decreasing lactate levels all indicate improvement. Increasing lactate levels indicate continued inadequate perfusion at the tissue level, resulting in metabolic acidosis, and then an increasing BUN and creatinine indicate renal dysfunction. That's it for the case study questions. So let's do a quick review. And once we're done with this, uh, I'll make sure that we have the Jeopardy uh, review opened up for you for shock so that you can review that uh, before test one. So looking at these, what I would like you to do is figure out the answers to these questions first. So the questions are, what are four regulatory mechanisms that allow maintenance of cellular metabolism? Which of the mechanisms for cellular metabolism is disturbed for each of the following? Hypovolemic shock, obstructive shock, distributive shock, cardiogenic shock. And what are some signs and symptoms that differentiate the types of shock, including diagnostic findings and physical assessment findings? Um, so... So if you want right now, go ahead and pause and try to answer these questions on your own and then go ahead and hit play when you're ready to hear the answers because I will give them to you right now. So for question one, the four regulatory mechanisms that allow maintenance of cellular metabolism. So remember, cellular metabolism requires oxygen in and waste out. So think of our plumbing. So key concepts to remember, cardiac output is our heart pump, O2 delivery, blood vessels, the diameter, tone, and blood volume, and then the tissues, whether or not they're able to extract and use the oxygen. Question two, which of the mechanisms for cellular metabolism is disturbed for each of the following? For hypovolemic shock, there's not enough water in the tank. So remember, it results in a decrease decreased cardiac output due to decreased filling pressures. There is systemic vascular resistance, which increases as a compensatory mechanism. RA pressure is decreased as the amount of fluid returning to the heart is decreased. So for cardiogenic, uh, the pump, it's a malfunctioning pump, uh, usually with like congestive heart failure uh, or an MI. So cardiogenic shock is caused by decreased contractility, which results in decreased cardiac output in the face of adequate or increased filling pressures. In an attempt to increase cardiac output and blood pressure, vasoconstriction occurs as a compensatory mechanism, increasing afterload, which is systemic vascular resistance. Right atrial pressure is increased due to volume excess. And with obstructive shock, that's our clogged pump, clogged valves, or tamponade, or tension numeral. So there's widespread vasodilation causing decreased systemic venous return, resulting in vascular pooling. The blood volume does not change, however, you have relative hypovolemia because of decreased venous return. And then for distributive, the pipes are expanded. So Okay. 
So for distributive shock, let me go back here because I didn't write that down. I'm going to see a few times I'm having to look for it. So distributive shock, remember, has the three. So it's septic, neurogenic, or anaphylactic. And then each of those are a little different. Um, all right, so question three. What are some signs and symptoms that differentiate Different types of shock include diagnostic findings and physical assessment findings. So, um, let's see. I wrote down, I'm trying to look at my notes here. Okay, so hold on, let me go back. I did write down a little bit more for distributive shock, uh, which is in question two, so I'll give you some more information. Um, so for sepsis, remember it's infection, it's directly related to poor vascular tone and vasodilation with venous cooling. You have relative hypovolemia despite adequate volume. And then for uh, neurogenic, which is the CNS injury, so, um, We have uh, some hemodynamics to look out for, cardiac output, central venous pressures, and PAOP are low due to decreased venous return, and systemic venous return is low. And then uh, for anaphylactic, we've got, uh, which is related to the allergy, so it's a result of widespread hypersensitivity reaction causing a release of histamine. Uh, resulting in vasodilation, which is hy causes hypotension, and increased capillary permeability, causing edema and smooth muscle contraction, which gives us our airway issues. Manifestations related to the overreaction of an immune response. So tachypnea, wheezing, stridor, cyanosis, urticaria, and itching. Um, so for the third question, uh, signs and symptoms that differentiate the different types of shock, and then um, diagnostic findings and physical assessment findings. So I wrote down here page 262, look up hemodynamic parameters. So I was just going to go through each of these real quickly. Um, so cardiogenic shock, you have decreased cardiac output, increased CVP and PAOP. You have increased SVR and decreased SVO2. You have hypotension and tachycardia. Um, neurogenic, you have decreased cardiac output. Remember, this is with that distributive. So neurogenic is decreased cardiac output, decreased CVP and PAOP. You have decreased systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. A decreased SVO2, you'll have hypotension and tachycardia. With obstructive, you'll have decreased cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, decreased SVO2, hypotension and tachycardia. You'll have variable CVP and PAOP. And then for anaphylaxis, you'll have decreased cardiac output, decreased CVP and PAOP. You'll have decreased SVR, decreased SVO2, and you'll have hypotension and tachycardia. And then for hypovolemic, remember you have not enough water in the tank, you'll want to do your assessments. So, and you should be able to go back and look at uh, essentially for the different types of shock, what are some of the diagnostic tools that you have to determine what type of shock and then uh, what are some important physical assessment findings for each type of shock too. So make sure that you know those independently. Um, let's see, so, and then remember to know early septic shock and late septic shock. So in early septic shock, you have increased cardiac output, a decreased CVP and PAOP, decreased SVR, increased SVO2. You might have normal or a little low of a blood pressure, you'll have some tachycardia and hyperthermia. 
and then for late septic shock, you'll have decreased cardiac output, variable CVP and the PAOP, decreased SVO2, variable SVR, hypotension, tachycardia, and hypothermia. All right, so I can tell you what, I might have a couple more review questions for you to do. So let's finish off this lecture with these questions and then we'll be done. All right, so in a patient without a central line, which clinical finding does the nurse look for to indicate effective response to treatment in the initial stage of shock? Increased urine output, increased heart rate, decreased bowel sounds, or decreased blood pressure. All right, the answer is A. So your rationale, we have increased urine output that indicates fluid volume status is normalizing. Tachycardia indicates the body is still compensating for inadequate cardiac output. So we have decreased blood pressure and bowel sounds, which both indicate shock is continuing. Question, review question two. So after receiving the change of shift report, which of the following patients should the nurse assess, assess first? 75 year old admitted for an MI, noted to be confused. 70 year old um, type two diabetic with a history of mitral valve prolapse, scheduled to receive IV antibiotics. A 60 year old with a pacemaker with a heart rate of 64 beats per minute requesting assistance to the bathroom or a 45-year-old scheduled for a thallium scan receiving warfarin for atrial fibrillation. Your answer is A. Confusion in a patient after an MI may be the first indicator of decreased cardiac output in the beginning of cardiogenic shock. All right, question three. What is the third stage of shock? Primary stage, progressive stage, tertiary stage, or refractory stage. B, the progressive stage is the third stage. Stages are on uh, pages 259, 14.2. Four stages are initial, compensatory, progressive, and refractory. Question four, what is one clinical manifestation of obstructive shock? Increased urine output, muffled breath sounds, decreased appetite, or hyperactive bowel sounds? Answers B. Muffled breath sounds may indicate a tension pneumothorax. Question 5. What is the second step in the sepsis continuum? Multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, sepsis, septic shock, or systemic inflammatory response syndrome? So SIRS is the second step in the sepsis continuum. Remember, you have the infection first, then you have SIRS, then sepsis, and then septic shock leading to MOD. Uh, make sure you complete the practice quiz, uh, which is available on uh, Canvas. And then um, I'm not sure if this is still um, adequate. I'll double check and make sure that this still works. Um, it should, the SurveyMonkey link, and uh, then make sure to also do the Jeopardy, uh, Shock Jeopardy, and then make sure to look back into Davis Edge and apply what you've learned, and that concludes our shock lecture. If you have any questions, please ask faculty. Thank you.